Welcome to worship for July 11, 2021. My name is John Hagman, pastor here at First Presbyterian Church in Morganton, North Carolina. If you're joining us online for the first time or the 50th, we are so glad that you're here. We want to connect and get to know you, so if you would, uh, consider taking a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel or like this video if you're worshiping with us on Facebook. You can also follow the link at the bottom of your screen to our website and click the button to connect with us. We'd love to hear from you and to learn how we can walk alongside you on your journey of faith. And so whether you're online or in person, thanks for being part of our community of faith here at FPC Morganton. Today, friends, we begin a new sermon series titled Faith Foundations. Paul's letter to the Ephesians lays a firm foundation for the Christian faith. Not only is the gospel of Jesus Christ good news, it invites everyone to embrace a new identity that impacts every aspect of life. Our allegiances, the choices we make, the relationships we maintain with God and with others, everything. Faith in Christ provides a firm foundation for godly living and places those brave enough to follow on the path towards wisdom. Our sermon series will explore these foundations and see how they impact our lives today. So I pray you'll be blessed by this study of the book of Ephesians, and I pray that your life will be changed, and mine too. So let's be called into worship using the words of Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who dwell therein. For the Lord has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, and who may stand in God's holy place? Those of innocent hands and purity of heart, who do not swear on God's being, nor do they pledge by what is false. They shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of their salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek you, O Lord, and those who seek your face, O God of Jacob. God of all creation, open our hearts that Christ the King of glory may enter and rule our lives. Give us clean hands and pure hearts that we may stand in your presence and receive your blessing through the same Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Church, let's lift our voices and praise God together in song.
Friends, our first reading comes from Psalm chapter 85, verses 8 through 13. Hear the word of God. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, and that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before Him and will make a path for His steps. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, the psalmist calls us to have clean hands and pure hearts. When we come into the holy presence of God, our own humanity is laid bare. When we stand in the living presence of truth, our own falsehood is revealed. And so, people of God, let us acknowledge who we are and ask our ever-present God to forgive us. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin together using the prayer on your screen, followed by a brief moment of silence for your personal prayers. So church, let's prepare our hearts to pray together. God of mercy, you sent Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside your way. We are misled by pride, for we see ourselves pure when we are stained and great when we are small. We have failed in love, neglected justice, and ignored your truth. Have mercy, O God, and forgive our sin. Return us to paths of righteousness through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. So God, hear now the prayers that we lift to you in the silence of our hearts. Just as David delights in the Lord, let us rejoice and praise that our debts are now pardoned and we have been made clean. Friend, hear the good news. Through Christ, I declare with full confidence that your sins and mine have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. Rejoice in this new life and be at peace. And since we have been forgiven in Christ, let us also forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Glory be to the Father. I'm a child of the 1980s. Much of my nostalgia comes from family sitcoms that were prevalent during this time. One of those was Family Ties. From 1982 to 1989, Family Ties chronicled the lives of ex-hippies Stephen and Elise Keaton, and their conservative son Alex, daughters Mallory and Jennifer, and later a younger son named Andrew. The show was nominated for 43 awards and won 23 of them, including five primetime Emmys. Family Ties is perhaps best known for launching the career of one Michael J. Fox, who also starred in Back to the Future, which just so happens to be the greatest movie of all time. But the show Family Ties explored how very different people could be part of the same family. The hippie progressive Keaton parents somehow birthed a Reagan-loving conservative dynamo in Alex P. Keaton. While political disagreements, squabbles, and ways of viewing the world provided a humorous backdrop for family drama, they were always able to work through their differences and find ways to love each other in the end. The first followers of Jesus faced a similar challenge. The Jewish heritage, traditions, and sensibilities of most of the first disciples clashed with the dynamic growth of the faith amongst Gentile believers. With all these differences, different ways of living, different values, different ways of seeing the world, how could these two cultures possibly coexist, let alone sustain and further the good news of Jesus Christ? The Apostle Paul pens a letter from prison addressed to the church at Ephesus, but it reads more like a universal letter to all believers. Paul's letter lays a firm foundation for the Christian faith. Not only is the gospel of Jesus Christ good news, but it also invites everyone to embrace this new identity that impacts every aspect of life. Faith in Christ provides a firm foundation and places those brave enough to follow on the path to wise and godly living. And so friends, before we dive in, let's pray and ask God to be our teacher. 
And so, God, we do invite you to come and be our teacher. Lead us through your Holy Spirit to see the truth as it points to your Son, Jesus, and having encountered Him, may we never be the same. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, our scriptures for today are Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3-14. through 14. Hear the word of God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before Him in love. He destined us for adoption as His children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace that He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace that He lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, He has made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure that He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of Him who accomplishes all things according to His counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of His glory. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Unlike other letters like Corinthians and Galatians, Paul isn't addressing hot-button issues in Ephesians. However, Paul is still writing to Jew and Gentile readers alike and is trying to instruct them on the foundations of this new faith in a new place amongst a new group of people. In the original language, this whole passage that we just read is one giant run-on sentence. It just keeps going and going. The author is on a roll with a stream of praises to God and descriptions of the blessings that God has given. This letter starts with blessings and a sort of joyful description of the benefits of the faith. It opens with the words, Blessed be God, which is a familiar formula for Jewish prayers. Hearers of the letter are blessed by God in Christ with every spiritual blessing. They are chosen by God to be holy and blameless before Him in love. They are adopted as God's children. They are redeemed and forgiven. They are given an inheritance in Christ. And because of Christ, they are marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. I mean, these first few verses, they sound like good news, don't they? But did you notice the pronouns Paul uses here? There are a lot of we and us statements. They apply to those who have already heard the good news and follow Jesus, devoting their lives to his teachings. And who would have been the first ones to hear and follow? Yeah, mostly Jewish folks, right? A few Gentiles for sure, but mainly it's Jews in first century Palestine. Now that the gospel has spread, there are lots of questions about what happens next. I mean, who is us now? Do Gentiles become Jewish? Do they get circumcised and follow the kosher laws? Are Gentiles second-class citizens of this new faith that emerges from the roots of Judaism? Then in verse 13, Paul changes the game. With four words, the story explodes. In him, you also. Paul extends these blessings to others who are hearing the word of truth, the gospel of their salvation, and believed in Jesus recently. They too are now marked and sealed by the Holy Spirit and included in the pledge and inheritance of God's own people. And so Paul uses two metaphors to talk about this new arrangement. The first is the language of family, and the second is the language of economics. Paul uses the language of adoption as God's children. Later in the letter, Paul refers to Gentiles as being aliens, strangers of the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God. The grace of God, then, is the opposite of this. In Christ, they are now invited to be part of God's adoptive family, God's multicultural, multiracial, multiethnic family based on faith. Zeta Maldonado Perez reminds us that the notion of God dwelling in all saints would have been foreign to Gentiles used to seeing their gods dwelling in pantheons. Becoming adopted and marked and sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, which indwells them, would have been completely unheard of. And so, this would have been incredible news for Gentile believers. Paul also uses the language of economics when he writes about an inheritance and a pledge. In verse 10, Paul writes about God's plan. This word in the original language is 
oikonomia. Other translations render it administration instead of plan. But most commonly, it's a term used to describe the economics and the management of the household. An inheritance involves family connections, but also involves a promise of blessing. At a certain point, the father of the household passes away and leaves behind a blessing for his children. Another word that Paul uses is that of pledge. Believers get the benefits of the promise now, but it's more like a movie trailer, just a small taste of what is still to come. Phoebe Perkins writes this, Although Ephesians depicts the gifts of salvation as fully present in the lives of believers, the designation pledge suggests a future perfection of this experience. A Semitic loan word, pledge is used in commercial text for security, guarantee, or deposit. The translation pledge would be misleading if it suggested a legal promise to fulfill a commitment that establishes a human right against God. Rather, the deposit indicates that one has already received part of what has been promised to secure future delivery. And God has lavished this pledge, this grace, this redemption upon Jew and Gentile alike. They have redemption and yet are still moving toward redemption. It's present and future tense. So what does this mean for you and me? Well, the way I read it, these promises extended to those who believe in Jesus today as well. You and I are included in the family of God and have redemption even as we move toward redemption. It's now and yet still to come. Phoebe Perkins writes that Ephesians uses the language of divine election to describe the experience of God's grace touching the lives of believers, but it's not us against them. Instead, she writes, Ephesians sees redemption as the purpose that God has embedded in creation as a whole. God's grace has been lavished upon us, and we have received redemption today, and there's still more to come. I love how Eugene Peterson translates the original language in the message. Listen to what he says. How blessed is God, and what a blessing He is. He's the Father of our Master Jesus Christ and takes us to the high places of blessing in Him. Long before He laid down earth's foundations, He had us in mind, had settled on us as the focus of His love, to be made whole and holy by His love. Long, long ago, He decided to adopt us into His family through Jesus Christ and what pleasure He took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of this lavish gift-giving by the hand of His beloved Son. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, His blood poured out on the altar of the cross, we are a free people, free of penalties and punishments, chalked up by all our misdeeds. And not just barely free either, abundantly free. He thought of everything, provided for everything we could possibly need, letting us in on the plans He took such delight in making. He set it all out before us in Christ, a long-range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in Him, everything in deepest heaven, everything on planet Earth. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, He had His eye on us had designs on us for glorious living, part of the overall purpose He is working out in everything and everyone. It's in Christ that you, once you heard the truth and believed it, this message of your salvation found yourselves home free, signed, sealed, and delivered by the Holy Spirit. This down payment from God is the first installment on what's to come, a reminder that we'll get everything God has planned for us, a praising and glorious life. Friends, you and I are invited to find out who we are and what we're living for in Christ. And so may we find comfort and peace and joy knowing that we are included in plans that have been in play since before the beginning and continue still today. May we be filled with gratitude that we are chosen, sealed by the Holy Spirit, and are now part of the family of God with all the benefits and all the promises that come with it. And may we live into this new identity and a new way of life, following Jesus and committing ourselves to his teachings to love God with everything we've got and to love our neighbors as ourselves. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
we know that everything we have belongs to God. I want to personally thank each of you for how freely you give each week. It's your generosity that supports the mission of our church in Morganton and in Burke County and beyond. And I pray that you will see God working this week through your faithful stewardship of God's kingdom. Friends, God has shown us the meaning of generosity and the beautiful diversity of creation in the overflowing love of Jesus Christ in the never-ending gift of the Holy Spirit. God has abundantly blessed us and called us to be a community that honors each other, to serve others with joy, and to share our love and material possessions as well. Let us rejoice in what we have been given and in what is ours to give. So church, let us pray together. Ever-present God, with this offering we present also ourselves all that we have been and all that we are and all that we shall become. In our resolve to walk in your way, Accept us and accept our offering, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ, whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Church, we are a, a body of believers who has been called to pray, and so let's pray together. God of healing and wholeness, as the world is opening, people are traveling, and our faces are once again being seen from behind our masks. It'd be easy to forget where we've been and where, what we've learned and who we've lost. Help us, holy God, not to be so desperate to move forward that we fail to appreciate the present. The communion of friends gathering, the sounds of children summering, the open road of vacation adventuring. Help us, holy God, not to be so desperate to move on that we neglect to pray for those still suffering, the businesses forced to close, employees laid off, families grieving, loved ones lost, COVID patients still waiting for renewed health, countries without access to vaccines. Help us, holy God, embrace the lessons we have learned, the grace we have received, and the hope you offer every day but especially in the tough and tragic days when we lean on our faith to get us through. You are here for us, God, and we are grateful. Help us to be here for each other, acting as your hands and feet in a hurting world. United as a family of faith and as the body of Christ, we lift these prayers up to you, God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So friends, may you know that you are included in God's plans that have been at play since before the beginning and they still continue today. May you be filled with joy and gratitude knowing you are chosen and sealed by the Holy Spirit and you are now part of the family of God with all the benefits and all the promises that come with it. May you live into this new identity and a new way of life following Jesus and committing yourself to His teachings and to love God with everything you've got and to love your neighbor as yourself. May the love of God and the abiding grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.